if you would, open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And what we're doing right now is we're beginning a, uh, a new thing, Sunday evenings. We're going to be going verse by verse through the book of 1 Peter. Um, but while we do this, I'm sort of going to plod through and take my time. Because what I want to do is bring up topics as they arrive in the scripture here. And then sort of expound on that. Take that maybe topically and survey, see how it applies to today. So today we'll give you a really good sample of what I think to expect as we move forward. Um, I'm going to do it a little different than I would if it was a Sunday morning study. Because on Sunday mornings, I would feel like I need to move a lot quicker through the scriptures. Lest I be in one little book for 10 years. You know, not like I'm going to do that really. But <laughs> but I would feel more of a burden to move quickly. Uh, just, just so that I made sure people got more of the word. But because Sunday evenings is sort of an extra Bible study, I feel like we can really take our time and we can really just, you know, dig deep into one section or one idea or one passage and hopefully make it a huge blessing in people's lives. So let's read 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So he begins his epistle. It was written by Peter, and it is written to these various people, just, just whoever's out there, you know, in these various locations. He's writing outside of Jerusalem. You know, he's writing outside of Israel to these groups. Notice that he calls himself Peter. He doesn't call himself Simon. His given name was Simon. For the majority of his life, this is what he was called, Simon. Um, but he was given a new name by Jesus, this name Peter. And this is the name he's mostly known by. He doesn't forget that he had an old name. He even uses it in the second epistle. He says Simon Peter. He refers to himself as Simon Peter, maybe helping them make sure they know which Peter's writing to them. Um, I just think it's neat that as a believer in Christ, we are we have two identities. You know, I have my, my pre-Christ identity, and then I have my in-Christ identity. And I'm not completely free from the desires of the flesh and from the, the pull of my sin nature. I mean, to say I'm not completely free is somewhat of an understatement. <laughs> I'm not completely free from my, my own sinful desires, my old sinful desires, but I identify myself as the new creation. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. So he calls himself Peter. I take that as encouragement that we should be focusing on our new identity in Christ as believers, not on our past sins. I want to learn from those things. I want to take heed from that. I want to take heed even from my current sinful struggles. But I, I, I identify myself by my new and permanent nature in Christ, not my dead and passing nature of sin. This is who I am, you know. And, and the other is just this dead body that I have to carry around that, that sometimes causes trouble. Um, he says to the pilgrims, um, oh, excuse me, calls himself an apostle of Jesus Christ. I mean, every believer is a saint. That is clear in the scripture. If you're a believer, you're a saint. You're a holy one. But not every believer is an apostle. Peter calls himself an apostle here. And you might think, well, there were the 12 apostles and that's it. Um, but there are actually some today claiming to be apostles right now. There's a modern movement of people claiming to be apostles, modern day apostles, called the New Apostolic Reformation, or the NAR for short. And this group of people are claiming some pretty radical things. You may have even heard of some of these names like IHOP, the International House of Prayer, um, that have become more swung more and more weird as they've, as they've continued in their ministries. And now you may have been blessed by these ministries. You might be familiar with them. But there are some claims by leadership in them that they are the new apostles for the end times. And uh, so we want to talk, take a moment to talk about what it means to be an apostle. Biblically, what's the stance there and all that sort of thing. So the apostles were um, really the, the word apostles used in sort of two different ways in the Bible. One, you might think of it as apostle capital A, the apostles. You know, we're talking about the 12 chosen by Jesus. And you may include uh, Paul amongst that list as well because he was sort of selected specially by Jesus Christ in a vision and all that. And then you've got apostle lowercase a, and that just seems to be meaning one who is sent. In fact, that's what the word means, apostola. It just means I send, apostolo, I send out. And so when you're sent out, you are apostled. <laughs> you're, you're sent out there. Um, this seems to be something that could refer to like a missionary in general. You know, I mean, I could say they're an apostle, but I wouldn't put sort of the capital A on it and attach to them 
the type of authority that you saw in the apostles of Jesus Christ. That's something very unique and very special. Well, there are actually qualifications in the Bible for choosing a new apostle. Um, after Judas died, well, okay, let me back up just a second and explain why this happened. Judas dies, there's now 11 apostles, and Peter stands up and says in Acts 1, we need somebody else. And you might ask, why do they need somebody else? Well, my personal theory on that is that Jesus sent his disciples out two by two. And one of them was partnered with Judas. That was his partner. This is who they went out with. And so I think they need to bring somebody else alongside who can be numbered amongst them that can be the partner of whoever it was that would walk with Judas. Um, so they wouldn't be alone. He sent them in twos, not by themselves. And so now they go, hey, we need to bring someone else in. They cast lots. They do all this thing. And they bring in Matthias. Some people think Matthias was a mistake, actually. Um, I've heard teaching that says that I, he, they think this is before the Holy Spirit was given. Matthias was just a mistake. They shouldn't have done that. Um, I'm not inclined to take that. I think that kind is kind of an extreme view. <laughs> and I don't think we have clear indication in the scripture that that's the case. So I'm like, fine, there's, there he is. You have another one of the 12. But again, there's just these, these 12. And there are no instructions in the New Testament for, un, for appointing new apostles after these guys die. In Ephesians, we have instructions about the, the roles of the church in various passages of scripture, like the pastoral epistles, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. We're told about anointing or bringing in new elders and new leadership in the church, deacons and, and pastors, this, these sorts of positions. We're not told anything about bringing in new apostles. It just, it just doesn't seem to be a normal thing that you'd expect to see apostles around. These apostles were unique. They had to have traveled with Jesus, seen Jesus with their own eyes physically in order to be considered an apostle. In fact, for Matthias to be considered to be joining them, they had to have, he had to have been with Jesus from the time of his baptism of John all the way through the ministry. That was one of the requirements. So certainly the new apostles don't fit this requirement. I mean, unless they're extremely old. <laughs> in which case, I really want to meet these guys and learn what it was like to walk with Jesus, but, but I don't think that's the case. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 9.1, Paul is defending himself as an apostle. And he says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? Speaking of that appearance of Jesus, he had a special commission from Jesus to go be the apostle to the Gentiles. So he's sort of a special case calling right there. But this, these don't seem to be offices in the church that get passed on and passed on and passed on. It's more of a progression. There were the apostles and prophets in Ephesians 4, and then... Pastors and teachers set up for the edification of the saints, the, for the work of the ministry. And it seems that those, those ministries were temporary. It was to get the word out. That's why churches are never called to appoint more apostles. The qualifications of other leaders are given, but apostles are not mentioned. And after the word had gone out, the word now had more authority than anybody in the church. Anybody in the church. Remember when Paul wrote in Galatians 1, even if me, even if we, or an angel from heaven come to you preaching another gospel, let him be accursed. So in other words, the word that we carry to you, that has the authority. So I want to make a, a difference real quick, a distinction. Apostles, even Jesus' apostles, did not bring, or I should say did not make new doctrine. They delivered God's teachings. They simply delivered what God showed them through the Holy Spirit and of course through Jesus Christ. They just, they just brought the teachings. It, there was new teaching. It was new doctrine, that's for sure. But they didn't make new doctrine. Jesus taught it. Then through his teachings and through the Holy Spirit, they then said, okay, let's communicate this to others. There's a difference here between what's happening then and what's happening now. Because what's happening now is not something Jesus taught. It is not something the Holy Spirit has communicated through the church or something like that over the ages. There's just new stuff going on. So they just carried the doctrine of Jesus forward. They didn't make new doctrine. They're more like the straw than the soda, if that makes sense. <laughs> and now that you've got the soda, you don't need the straw. You know, and that, that's it. Here's, here's the stuff. This is it right here. We have their teachings right there. Um, and now it takes authority over them. Now, it seems that nowadays um, there is a really strong movement. You may have heard of it, like I said, this new apostolic reformation going around. It is all over the place, and our, probably our most local representative of it is Bethel in Redding, California, Bethel Church in Redding, California. You may be familiar with the pastor, his name is Bill Johnson, or you may be more familiar with the group, the worship group that has come out of this church called Jesus Culture. 
and they have they do many many um, songs, very popular songs. Actually, most of their very popular songs are cover songs. They're not the songs they wrote. They just covered them. Um, then they have their own original songs, which I've looked up the lyrics to, and I just sort of scratch my head, and I'm like, I don't think I would say that about the Lord. That's kind of strange. And there's some kind of just like I wouldn't say, oh, that's apostasy. It's just you just go, hmm, it's uh, kind of weird. You know, I'm not really sure about that. Not sure if I'd sing that to the Lord. Well. These apostles, you might ask, why do they even want the title apostle? It seems that they want the title because then it gets them an authority over the church in general. You see, now, a, a pastor is a servant to the church, but, I'm, but I, we don't believe in what we call a shepherding ministry, <laughs> which is too kind of a title to give this ministry, where, where if you're going to buy a new car, you come to me to get info on what kind of car you should get. If you're gonna get, you want to get married, then I'm going to be your matchmaker. Like, that's just weird. That's just odd. You know, you have the Holy Spirit. I am called to teach and serve, but I'm not called to rule over your life. And if I ever pretend I am, it's time for me to get fired and get a real job. Because ruling over people's lives is not a job. No. Um, we labor in, in prayer and in the word, and we labor in the ministry. And when we start to do other things, that's when we need to step aside. Well, I would like to share with you some of the strange practices that you see going on over at uh, Bethel Redding. And I say this, now I want to say this carefully. There are believers who love Jesus at this church. And I'm not saying that the lead pastor, Bill Johnson, is, is um, unsaved. I have no idea. I have no idea. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why I have no idea is because I don't know what their gospel is because they very rarely speak of it. But... Because they're hosting huge conferences and inviting all of our youth to come out to it to receive their apostolic teaching, we have to, in response to that, say, let's evaluate that ministry. You're claiming to be an apostle to me. I think I'm going to test all things and hold fast to that, which is good. So some of the things that are going on, well, as one of the Jesus Culture band members said, um, they recounted a story about how Pastor Bill... Uh, Apostle Bill Redding, uh, Bill Johnson, excuse me, <laughs> for Bethel Redding, how he was praying and asking, God, why did you choose Redding? Why did you choose Redding for this wonderful new work in the latter days? And how God said, I didn't choose Redding, I chose Bill. And it's this sort of heaping people to come after you, as opposed to coming, having them come after um, the, the gospel and Jesus Christ and that message, but it's sort of bringing men after yourself. And we're warned of these kind of false teachers. They, they bring people to follow them as opposed to just following the word. There are new understandings of the scriptures coming from these apostles. Like even, even uh, Bill, Pastor Bill, will say like that he has, because of the spirit, he can, he can have a special interpretation of this passage and really know what it means. And so instead of carefully studying the word to understand it, it's like, you know, kind of like this wishy-washy symbolism and, um, yeah, yeah. And the new doctrines are formed based on this kind of thing. This is dangerous, I think. Now, let me give you some examples of some of the weird practices that are happening with the endorsement of this lead pastor. Um, and again, I say this uh, kind of with a heavy heart because I, I don't like singling people out. But I think that when someone puts themselves up as an apostle to the world, they either need to be tested and approved or tested and openly rejected because those who are sinning openly should be rebuked openly. Um, you may have heard of something called grave soaking, although I bet you probably have not. Sarcastically, uh, people who come against it call it grave sucking. I don't think either title is really very good. <laughs> but what they do is they go to the, to the grave of a saint, of a, of a real believer who God has used powerfully in the past. Sometimes they even grow to the graves of some apostate people who came up with their own weird teachings. And they go and they lay on the grave and they lay against the tombstone and they lay there and they pray and they pray and they pray to try to soak up some of the Holy Spirit that is remaining in the grave of the saint to try to empower them in their lives. This is, this is what happens when you are too experience-based. I should say too fluffy and feelings-based. You have to keep getting weirder and weirder and weirder for the newer, newer experience until you just start doing some crazy stuff. At Bethel Redding, this is how they first came on my radar, supposedly the glory cloud of God appeared during their worship service. Now that would be awesome. That would be awesome if God's glory showed up. I'm not really sure about the phrase glory cloud, 
Um, I don't really see that actual phrase in scripture. What I do see is God is glorious and he comes in a cloud to shield people from his incredible glory. But the cloud isn't him. You know what I mean? And so the cloud's the, sort of the protection for the people. And so, um, but supposedly God's glory cloud has appeared during their worship services at Bethel. But it's not just rumor, there's video. And so there are YouTube videos. You can, you're welcome to look this up. Look up the glory cloud at Bethel. Um, just Google it. It's on YouTube. I'm sure you could see it. And it is, it's just painfully obvious that somebody put glitter in the air. It's just painfully obvious. And you have people who are, they're worshiping and stuff, and they see it, and they go, oh, hey, look over there. And there's one guy with his glasses, and he's going, doing this, you know, in the video and stuff. And I'm just going, you know, I think if God's glory showed up, you wouldn't be like, hmm, with the bifocals, without the bifocals, you know. I don't think you'd be doing this. I think it's clearly a sham. And I'm not saying that the pastor's doing it on purpose. Maybe unbeknownst to him, someone's up there. Possibly he knows. I don't know. It, the point is, it doesn't matter. It, it's, it's demonstrably weird. There's also statements about, um, about how the, the feathers are manifesting themselves. And he quotes the psalm saying, God will cover you with his feathers. Uh, <laughs> and I'm going like, I think he said wings. But anyway, but he would cover us, you know, and then, and then there's feathers just manifesting. You know, on the way up here today, I saw a feather on the steps coming upstairs. And I thought to myself, like, there you go. There's God's glory right there. Proof. No. Um, it's just feathers. I mean, you know, for all, we, we actually have had feathers because of pigeons getting up in our attic. <laughs> you come and you find feathers, except they were pigeon feathers. So I'm just, there's just no biblical basis for thinking that this is what you should expect. You don't see it in Acts. You don't see it in the Gospels. You don't see it in the Old Testament. You don't see it anywhere. It's just, it's just odd. Some of the stuff that they do gets into some strange teachings. One of the things Pastor Bill teaches is that Jesus himself was born again. He says he had to have been born again. And he goes into some justifications as to why, to which we respond, you only need to be born again if you are dead in sin. And um, he was resurrected, yes, but there's no statement about him being born again in the scriptures. But this helps because what Bill wants to do is humanize Jesus I should say, de-deify Jesus so that he can make it so that we feel we can have every experience Jesus had because Pastor Bill is all about signs and wonders and it's all about miracles. And this new apostolic movement is all about miracles, signs and wonders. Everyone they pray for gets healed. As Pastor Bill heard, put it in a sermon I heard him teach, he said, we're not saying that everybody always gets healed. We're not saying that. We're just saying, not on our watch. Meaning that whenever they pray for people, they all get healed. Why? Because here's the apostolic authority. Maybe you don't have it. Maybe you're not experiencing it. But here at Bethel Reading, everyone gets healed. So they claim everyone gets healed. Never mind if him and his wife both wear glasses. Never mind that his son, and I'm not saying this in a negative way about his son. I don't see anything wrong with it. Um, in fact, I think it's God putting it there for a reason. His son is 90% deaf and wears hearing aid. And Pastor Bill responds to this, and he says, well, I was fasting and praying for my son, that God would heal him. And his son's a grown man, it's not like a little boy. But I was fasting and praying for my son, and God told me, I'm healing him. And, and it was not, I'm going to heal him sometime in the future, it was, I am healing him. So we just believe God that he is healing him. And this was years ago, so years have gone by. And he says, and he still wears a hearing aid, and he's still out there, and he prays for people, and they get healed, but he's still, you know, but we're believing God for the healing. And it, and it seems to conflict with our belief that God will heal all the time, but we can't stop and think about that, because then it will, it will drain us of our anointing. What? <laughs> what? No, it, well, in a sense, it, what it does is it will shatter the pretend bubble that I've made. Unfortunately, a teaching that everybody gets healed hurts people. We know it's unbiblical. We know it's unbiblical. People die. That would imply that they don't get healed of everything. <laughs> people die. If Bethel Redding does a single funeral, they've admitted that people don't get healed of everything. Paul the Apostle had a thorn in his side and all this. God said, no, my grace is sufficient for you. He used it to keep him humble. It was a good thing. Jesus talked about how a man who was born blind, it was not because of sin. It was just, it was just the way it was, you know. And so we, we shouldn't think negatively upon those who have not been healed. In fact, you should expect there will be things in your life that will not get healed. 
It's going to happen. I, I, I suspect. Does that mean everything's? No, I've seen healings and, you know, it's happened and we've experienced it from cancer and some wonderful things. But we don't expect it every time because we don't control the will of God. But that's one of the teachings of their church that I think is very strange. When I go onto the, um, their website and I search at Bethel Reading, they also have the School of Supernatural Ministry, which I highly recommend not going to. And this, uh, this program, some, I didn't even know a student who was heading over to it. Um, but the, um, the program, this is where they do some very strange things. And you can get trained by the apostle and by this, by, he has a prophet who runs the school, who calls himself a prophet. So they have apostles and prophets. And in this school, um, you can get trained to do supernatural ministry. And then you go out into your churches and you try to incorporate their methods of sort of weird spiritual activities into your church. But you know what I can't find on the website, either for the school or on their church website? I cannot find the gospel of Jesus Christ anywhere. I mean, I want to know, do they have the gospel? Is it right or is it wrong? Are they just, they got the gospel, they're my brothers and sisters in Christ, but they just got some things weird or not? I don't know because they don't talk about it. Because in the sections that says, this is about the gospel, they go, yeah, signs and wonders point to the gospel. Signs and wonders draw people's attention to the gospel. Yeah, but what do you think the gospel is? How do people get saved? What are they saved from? What are they saved for? But this is not there. So there you go. I think that the danger of people saying they're modern day apostles is that they then set themselves up over the church as the new authorities in the church. And, um, and I, I try to be very careful. This is not humility, folks. This is just reality, like, and you know it. I am not the authority over the church. <laughs> Pastor Gary is not the authority over the church. He is a leader in our local congregation, but you, are accountable to God, and you get the Holy Spirit, and you get the Bible, and um, and so you, you're accountable. And, and this is a beautiful thing. Boy, it's a weight off my shoulders. I don't even want that kind of authority over people's lives. Are you kidding? The scariest thing when you give people advice is that they might actually take it. <laughs> and then you're responsible for whether it was good or not. Anyway, moving on. So uh, Peter calls himself an apostle. I don't think there are these modern day apostles. And I think the strange things they do is sort of evidence against any reason to trust them. Um, but then he writes his letter to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. The pilgrims of the dispersion. Now this concept, pilgrims, this sets up the theme of the whole book, 1 Peter. Pilgrims. I really encourage you when you go home, read 1 Peter sometime between now and next week. Just refresh yourself on it, refresh your hearts in it. Read it within your mind thinking, pilgrim, pilgrim, pilgrim. Now what's a pilgrim? A pilgrim is someone who is on a journey and they are temporary residents in the place where they live, even though where they live is not where they belong. And they're on their way to their homeland. That's what a pilgrim is. A temporary journey on my way to my homeland living for now in a place where I do not belong. Meaning the, the home I live in right now, I'm a pilgrim. This house that, I, that I, we finally bought, well, a portion of it, <laughs> um, is, is our first home, but it is not our last home. This is not my final home. This earth, this US government, this is not my final government. Thank you, Lord. This world is not my final world. This life is not my final life. This job is not my final job. None of this is final. We're pilgrims passing through. It's all, it's all going to burn, so to speak. It's all, it's all going to fall apart. Moth and rust destroy. Thieves break in and steal. But store up our treasures where that doesn't happen. In heaven, where our reward is. So if we look through 1 Peter and consider it like the pilgrim's handbook, It'll really help us. It'll remind us of our hope um, that this life will end soon. And think about it. For everybody that Peter wrote to, that short life has been over for longer than they lived it. They've been enjoying the, the, the pleasures and the joys of heaven for longer than they were living on the earth. And such will be the case for us soon enough. So it's going to give us the pilgrim mindset. That is, it's a, it's a heavenly mindset. It's the mindset that always has us being hopeful no matter what. That's a nice thing to have. It's nice to be hopeful. I didn't used to feel that way. I used to be kind of a pessimist. I called myself a realist, but I was a pessimist. And then as I got more and more theology in my heart and in my mind, I became a realist optimist because I realized 
the optimism that there is in Christ that's legitimate and that's rational and that's understandable. That it's just, it's all uphill, guys. It's all up. You know, the old phrase, this is, as, uh, this is as close to hell as you'll ever get. It's not this is as good as it gets. It's this is as bad as it gets. <laughs> so we learn how to react to life's troubles and to especially treat temporary things like they're temporary and be mindful of the things that are permanent as, as believers. That's what First Peter is going to help us to, to teach so, or to do. So what I want to do is just kind of like run through First Peter just survey it real quick and show you, just point out the pilgrim mentality. So if you're going to kind of ready to flip through, we're not going to read the whole thing, but I'll give you lots of references. So the first thing we'll learn in First Peter, I think, is the pilgrim has a destination. We're pilgrims, but our ultimate home is not here. We have a new destination. That's verses 3 through 5 here. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. So it just takes that distant image of heaven and brings it right up into your face so that you can remember freshly what it's all about. The pilgrim, according to this, we... we um, we lose our affections of this world and we start to gain affections for heaven because that's where it, it really, that's what it's really all about. In 1 Peter verses, chapter 1, verses 6 through 9, we learn how to rejoice in suffering. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The pilgrim can rejoice at all times. The Christian pilgrim knows their trials have a purpose, and they know how certain their salvation is. That's verses 10 through 12 how confident we can be in our salvation, we know that God's word is proven. As it talks in verses 10 through 12 about prophecy and the evidence to support our, our confident hope that we have. My hope is secure in Christ. I can't wait to talk to you guys about prophecy. I'll give you some examples of some fulfilled prophecy, which is one of my favorite things to do. Um, unfulfilled prophecy I find to be one of the most challenging things to study in the Bible, but fulfilled prophecy is one of the most rewarding things to study in the Bible. So, uh, so then we're told to, to live with our eyes on eternity, that's verses 13 through 23, because everything the pilgrim does is about getting where he's going. Every step the pilgrim takes is about getting closer to that final destination. And so we live with our eyes on eternity, like Jesus said, store up treasures in heaven. In verses 24 through 26 of chapter 1, we learn how temporary the world is. How temporary the world is, how passing the world is. It is fading away. The pilgrim focuses their life on eternal things when they realize how fading the world is. Like a dream when you wake up. It, it, and as you're first waking up, you know, you're just waking up. Maybe even right before you wake up, as your that dream just begins to fade and get a little bit like incoherent and a little bit distant. And then you come in and you wake up. We're sort of in that fading moment, remembering this is going to pass. I remember having a dream when I was a kid. I was very hungry. I was, I, like, I'm speaking of my entire childhood here. I was very hungry. And in my dream, I, there was a smorgasbord of, of like food, danishes and pastries and all kinds of yummy stuff. And I went around with a plate and I, got, I filled up the plate. And I'm not kidding you. I remember this dream. I got so excited about the food I was about to eat that I could feel myself starting to wake up. And I thought, oh no, oh no, oh no. And I woke up and I didn't even get to eat any of it, right? <laughs> And I was like, oh, and then you, of course you get up and you go into the kitchen and you're like, oh, and, and the more, the younger you are, the more a refrigerator is like an untranslated foreign language, you know, you just open it and you're like, I don't understand those things, you know, you need, you need food, not pieces of food. And so this is what it's like for those who don't store up treasures in heaven, they store up all this stuff on earth and then it, no, it just fades away and it's gone. You got nothing. But for those who are storing up treasures in heaven, it is just permanent joys and pleasures and treasures and wonders and the world is fading. In chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we learn about the pilgrim's food. 
what does the pilgrim eat, which is the word of God. We eat our daily bread. You know, we eat this scripture, the, desiring the pure milk of the word is the, is the um, analogy he uses here in chapter 2. Verses 4 through 10 of chapter 2, we get the pilgrim's identity, who the pilgrim is, understanding who you are as a pilgrim. That's huge, absolutely huge, because then you know what you should do in any circumstance in life because you know who you are. The pilgrim's conduct is from chapter 2.11 to chapter 3, verse 7. The pilgrim's conduct, how, from, from what, we, what we are, our identity, to how we live. In verses 8 through 12 of chapter 3, the pilgrim's walk of love, the emphasis on love. No description of the Christian life would be complete without stopping to pause for a moment and think about walking in love. Chapter, uh, chapter 3, um, from there, verse, uh, well, actually starting kind of in verse 9, but moving all the way to chapter 4, verse 6, the pilgrim is willing to suffer for righteousness, and this is huge. This is huge today on the verge of increased persecution in our country, and maybe, <coughs> maybe in other places as well. But here in America, where persecution is going to probably first take place in just general disapproval, maybe people losing a job, um, and lawsuits. I mean, it's just a question of whether you get targeted or not. The Christian, the pilgrim, is willing to suffer for righteousness. And for this, I applaud our sister who has refused to, to go against her conscience and against the scripture and endorse something that's not marriage as though it's marriage. Though some people see this as hate, they don't realize this is an act of love and obedience. But the Christian's willing to suffer for righteousness. Yes, there's a way out. In fact, there's almost always a way out of persecution if you're willing to compromise righteousness. But the pilgrim is not. Chapter 4, verse 7 through 19, the pilgrim's chief goal is God's glory and faithfulness to God. So he expects trials, and he doesn't always expect success in everything because his chief goal is to give God glory and represent God rightly in all that he does. And that he could walk away from a situation not counting heads to see how many agreed with him, but just to say simply, did I do what God wanted? Did I glorify God? I've got a king in my life, my Lord Jesus. Is he pleased? Is he pleased with the life I'm living? Is he pleased with how I handled that? And this so simplifies our situations. I mean, we are constantly evaluating, right? At least I know I'm an evaluator of my own. You know, how is that? How is this? How is that? How is this? How is that? Like, I try to like, avoid things like counting how many people have showed up for my Bible study or checking to see how many people have agreed with me on this or what impact did I have here and there because it's just inevitable that I just end up discouraged. I mean, no matter what, the, even if it's a great response, I just end up discouraged because I'm just having the wrong mindset. I should only look back at myself and say, Lord, was I faithful to you? Was I bringing you glory? Was I doing what you called me to do? That's all that I'm called to do, period. To just be simple-minded about it. I'm here for God's glory and to be faithful to him. I expect trials. I expect disappointments and all that, and that's fine. That's fine. That doesn't make them easy. <laughs> But it, does, but it makes it so they won't stop me in my tracks. I'll continue pressing forward. In chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, there's a word to old pilgrims. Now, just so you know, when the Bible speaks to old people, it almost always does so in a complimentary way. Our culture is completely the opposite. You're old. The Bible looks at you and goes, you're old. <laughs> you're old. Good job, you know, because it's sort of implied that with age comes wisdom and experience. And you know, you're probably, you're probably a better version of you now than you were when you were, you know, five years younger, 10 years younger, 20, 30, 40, for those who can say that. And, um, and this with, with, uh, with wisdom, with age comes wisdom, you know, if you walk in a way that you'll gain it, or you could miss out on it. I like Proverbs says, uh, gray hair is a crown of glory if it is found in the way of wisdom. So there's an if there, but yet it is there. And some of you are going gray early. You're just, you're wise, <laughs> wise beyond your years, Jessica. I want to go gray. I asked my wife, I'm like, I want to go gray. I just, I feel like, and, and I'm going to, because my dad is Santa Claus. <laughs> if you ever see him, he's... Santa Claus. So, one day. 
Then in verses 5 through 11 of chapter 5, we have a word to young pilgrims because the advice and counsel you give to the young is different than the older. And um, that's one of the things I love about getting to do Sunday evenings is typically I'm teaching the young pilgrims. You know, and so I sort of sort of hang on certain topics and certain subjects. I revolve around these things because that's the season of life they're in. It's kind of fun to move my, my teaching beyond that and sort of address all of life. It's nice. But, um, but Peter does that. He, he addresses the old and then the young. And then the letter concludes with grace and peace the way it started. So please go back over it and just read First Peter with these things in mind. And uh, just for your own edification. Not so you could feel like you got every single possible point of it figured out, but just so you could be like, let me see the cohesion of this concept of being a pilgrim, meaning this is not my homeland. This is a stewardship I have. This is a place I dwell in. And I mean, I'm a, I'm a patriot, but that's because I'm a Christian, which would make me be a patriot in any country I, I lived in, period. I would support it as much as I could, so long as it wasn't requiring me to turn against Christ or go against the Lord. I would submit to government, submit to authority. I mean, Christians should make the best citizens around. When governments hear about, their, about people getting saved, they should be stoked. Oh, that's awesome, man. That's that religion that's got that Romans 13 passage in there about obeying government. <laughs> you know, and we do, unless they ask us to go against God. But there's, sometimes there's this say, satanic attack, it seems, against, uh, against believers. Um, but anyhow, um, read it read it for yourself and just be edified and be encouraged. And as we're going to be going through it, just kind of plodding through and taking our time. So he addresses it to those uh, pilgrims who are scattered, the, the, the dispersion, they're dispersed in these various countries and all these, all these areas. You know, they're in Rome, Persia, Egypt, Arabia, they're north of Israel, they're outside of the land of Israel. Um, this may have been a result of persecution. We find that shortly after the rise of Christianity in Jerusalem, immediate persecution happened, and then people fled, and tons of people left the city of Jerusalem. Some of them were just like layabouts who really stuck around after Passover. You see, they came for Passover, then Jesus Christ died, he rose again, then people were seeing him, and they'd stuck around for Pentecost. You know, these were feasts where they were gathered from all over Israel into Jerusalem. And then after um, the ascension of Christ, they just kind of hung out, and they met daily. They met daily, and you're like, don't you guys have jobs? Well, they were pretty much on break. They were on vacation at the time. And so they met daily every day in the temple and praising and getting the word and sharing and praying and all this awesome stuff. The Holy Spirit came, and then persecution because the church was growing rapidly. And so persecution came, and then they sort of scattered out. But the apostles remained. They stayed in Jerusalem, but a lot of other people went either back to their homelands or maybe they went even further out just to get out of Dodge. What's so cool about this is that persecution backfires. And as Christians are spread out, you may as well be throwing the fire into new locations for it to spread out. And so people got saved all over the place. And in a very brief period of time, the gospel was presented all over the known world. I think this is a great principle for us to know. Persecution will backfire if Christians will have backbones. It doesn't. Now you can run from it. Don't get me wrong. But you can't compromise in it. That's the thing. Someone's coming after you. You Christian? Oh, that's it. You stay there. I'm coming back with three people with guns and knives. We're going to kill you. And you're like, well, let's see. Do I stay here or not? You know, this is, you're perfectly free to not stay there, but you are not free to compromise the gospel of Jesus. And that's the difference. That's the difference. To not compromise our faith and our trust in Christ. Um, but it doesn't mean that we like voluntarily show up and put our heads, you know, in the noose, so to speak. Um, you know, Paul appealed to Caesar. We can appeal to government. We can appeal to laws. We can, uh, we can run away. That's okay, too. But we cannot compromise our faith in Christ. And they didn't compromise that, and so the persecution backfired. And I feel like it always does. It seems historically. For Christians who will not compromise their faith, persecution will backfire. So in a sense, I can get kind of excited when persecution comes and we stand strong. Well, the next thing we see is um, verse 2 where he says, elect, speaking of the people, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. So they are, they're the elect from the Father, sanctified by the Spirit, sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, the Son. We have the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. You actually have the Trinity in this passage. Now, is this passage by itself teaching the Trinity? No, not by itself. Uh, the, tr the Trinity is a, is a doctrine that you sort of can't escape when you look at all the scriptures that teach about God. 
Um, but this isn't by itself teaching the entire doctrine of the Trinity, but it is supporting the Trinity. And so you've got the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Now let's look at <clears throat> the specific things said about them. We're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Elect. That brings up a really interesting doctrine. Anybody know what it's called? Election. The doctrine of election. That's right. And coming up, we have an election here in America. No, it's not about that kind of election. But the, the basic concept is the same, that God has elected who will be saved. He has chosen us, that we are chosen in him. The idea that God has decided from eternity who would be saved. And that is a thoroughly biblical concept. God is sovereign and God has made this decision. You can hardly deny this doctrine, especially when you see things like elect <laughs> in the scriptures, that we have been predestined, like in Romans 8, 29, right? So we're predestined, we're elect, that's a clear doctrine. God chose you, check us out, personally. He chose you. Wow, that's a blessing. He, he chose me. God loves me. God loves me. That amazes me. It says in Psalm 40, Many, O Lord my God, are your wonderful works which you've done, and your thoughts toward us cannot be recounted to you in order. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. His thoughts toward us, more than can be numbered. Psalm 139 verse 16 says, Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they, were, they all were written the days fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. God has already, it's all figured out ahead of time. I do believe this. I think that the God is sovereign. He has, he's, there, there's no surprises for God. There is something called open theism, which is, which is sort of like on the, you know, you have sort of Calvinism over here, Arminianism over here, and on the far reaches of Arminianism, you've got open theism, which is the idea that like, well, you know, God doesn't really know about everything. So you sort of get, get rid of the problem of evil by saying that God maybe didn't know about it. You know, and, I, and I'm sure it's more, more sophisticated than that, but that seems to be what it boils down to. Um, but now some go on the other side and they take this to mean if God has chosen us, then mankind has no choice. And that's where I would personally disagree. And I think the scripture disagrees too. Now let me be clear. Calvinism is, is, a, um, is a Christian belief. I mean, Christians believe it. I'll put it that way. And I've, I know Calvinists, and maybe some of you are Calvinists. Good. I'm glad you're here. Um, and I don't need to change your opinion on this. I'm going to share with you how I understand it from the scripture here. But Calvinism is like an in-house discussion. It's like a discussion about the use of the gift of tongues or the, um, uh, the offices of the church with, you know, what's the hierarchy of, you know, how decisions are made between pastors and elders and things like that. It's totally an in-house discussion. It doesn't affect our salvation. It's just, hmm, how does this work? But I do think Calvinism is wrong because while the Bible does say God's elected us, it does seem to assume that you actually have to choose to trust in Christ. In Acts chapter 17, verse 30, Peter says, God commands all men everywhere to repent. Or excuse me, I think it's Paul. All men everywhere to repent. Now God's commanding them all to repent. But what we're saying is here is God's commanding them to do something that he's chosen to He's not chosen them to do. And it starts to get a little confusing and complicated, right? John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him. So he's commanding them all to repent. He's telling them whoever believes will be saved. And I just think that I take that at face value. It's just plain. So here's my position on this. And it's not just my position. Like it's unique to me. Many believers have held this throughout time. It's that God is sovereign and he chooses. And man also makes a choice. I don't see a problem with that. I mean, me and my wife, we got married because we both made a choice. You can say, well, Mike, you chose her. Yeah, well, then she couldn't have chose you. And I'm like, well, actually, that wouldn't really work. You know, that's not how marriage works. I think that God chooses us and we choose God. And I think the scripture seems to clearly teach this. He's constantly telling people, repent or choose this day who you will serve. Or um, as, as Moses said, these commands are not too far from you that you cannot do them. They're not too, you know, you could choose this. So... There is, I think, at the heart of Calvinism, to then just, I just want to kind of give you a little brief discussion of this. There is two assumptions that I think I personally don't, I don't agree with. And the assumptions are this, that faith 
in Christ, putting faith in Christ is actually somehow a work. So by putting faith in Jesus, you're participating in salvation. You're sort of partially meriting your own salvation. But the Bible clearly juxtaposes, there's a word I used this morning that I'll use again just for fun. It juxtaposes, puts against each other the two ideas of faith and works, saying that these are opposites, right? You're saved by faith through grace, or by grace through faith, and then um, apart from works. So that they're separated from each other. So I can't say faith is a work. But if I believe faith is a work, then I can't let man choose to have faith. God has to give them faith. And that's kind of what Calvinism does. It says God gives you the faith. In fact, regeneration in Calvinism is usually flipped. It's uh, first the Holy Spirit comes and regenerates you. You're born again. And then you can't help but believe in Jesus. That's the irresistible grace part. Um, so I, I disagree with that. I think it's confused. Um, the second thing is that choosing God robs God of some of his glory. Catch that? The second thought in Calvinism is that choosing the Lord somehow robs some of the glory that belongs to God. Now, in this, I, 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 say, I pull, applaud my Calvinist friends. They love God's glory, and so do I. God gets all the glory. But they, there is a thought that by you choosing God, you're sort of taking some of that glory away from him. Now, if these two things, if you don't see a conflict between sovereignty and free will, then you don't need to be Calvinist. But if you see that there's a conflict and they can't be reconciled, then of course you're going to side on the, on the side of sovereignty. At least I would if I had to. And then you become Calvinistic. Uh, but again, it's an in-house discussion. And, um, and I'll, I'll ask, if you guys have questions later, we can talk about it more. I, I, I've looked into it somewhat, and I, uh, over the years especially, and I do think that that really comes down to that. I don't see a conflict between sovereignty and free will, and therefore the need for Calvinism just disappears. The Bible seems to teach both, so I believe both. And then it even qualifies it. It says in verse 2, elect, how am I elect? According to the foreknowledge of God the Father. So it seems to be qualified in the scripture. I'm, I'm, God knew ahead of time. He knew, he foreknew, knew ahead of time. I remember hearing a Bible college teacher that when I was in Bible college, he taught on one of these passages, and, and it's really consistent when God's, uh, like Romans 8, 29, whom he foreknew, he predestined. It says in Romans 8, 29, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be adopted and brought into the, the as sons of God. This, according to the foreknowledge, and he just said straight out, God's election has nothing to do with his foreknowledge. And then he moved on. And I'm sitting there going, but I just read it right in the passage right there, you know. Why was he saying that? Because he was, he was a going from a Calvinist perspective, and it was like, it just can't. It's illogical. It's irrational. You know, you can't say that. Um, but the Bible seems to say that, and so I'm just going to go with that. Now, the Bible doesn't say what God factored in. Like, what did he factor in? Did he go like, okay, is Don going to put his faith in me? If he is, I choose him. If he's not, I won't choose him. Or was it more complicated? Did he factor in, like, where you were going to be born and deciding where you were going to even live and what time period and all this other stuff? I'm under the impression that God factored in everything. That's what I think his foreknowledge represents, is everything. I think he factored in all that stuff. So I don't really think I can just pin it down to one thing. And this makes it more than God just choosing who um, would ever choose him. So his election is just kind of like responding to you. He's, he's, he's also making a choice here. And, um, and I do think it's complicated, but I also think that that's what scripture seems to teach. I love this scripture, Acts chapter 15, verse 18. I think it supports this idea. It says, known to God from eternity are all his works. I love that. Think about it. Known to God from eternity are all his works. All of his works are known. They were already known. They're still known. God has never been surprised. Never. He never truly changed his mind, but rather waited for people to change their minds and responded to that. Notice that whenever God, say, stops from doing something, it's because they repented, because they, they did this, they appealed to a sacrifice or something like this, and they got, okay, and God reacts to that. He reacts to us, but known to him from eternity was that this was going to happen. And he was just waiting for that moment. Um, if you can think of God as waiting. I mean, I don't know how you, the interplay between eternity and, and time works or all that. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's just, just brains all over the walls. Um, so, um, so we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. The Father. I love this. God is my Father. He is not only the Father. Um, <clears throat> 
of, you know, of the Trinity, but he's my father personally. This is why Galatians 4, 6 says this, and let me read it to you. And because you are sons, and, and by the way, let me just say this for the ladies. When the Bible's talking to men, it'll say men, sons. When it's talking to women, it'll say women, daughters, that kind of language. When it's talking to men and women, it'll say men, sons, because women are part of mankind. I mean, Adam and then Eve and all this. So this is not sexist language. It's inclusive. That's the gender inclusive language of the scripture is the male <coughs> default. <clears throat> now, you might be upset about that. It could have just as easily been the female default, and then it'd be the guys complaining, but whatever. But I want you to know that. You're not ruled out here where it says sons. <clears throat> because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. And that word Abba, this Aramaic word, that seems to be something like Papa or Daddy. It's just this intimate, personal, relational thing. We're, we're chosen by our dad, our Abba. That is so beautiful and so wonderful. Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. He said for them to pray, Our Father who art in heaven. You know, they didn't pray like that before. <clears throat> the Jews did not pray to their father and, oh, Abba, our father, our father. They just didn't pray like that. They didn't even want to use the name of God. They felt it was too holy. Jesus almost got stoned in John 5 when he calls God his father. Why? Because he called him his father. And just by calling God his father, it was like making himself equal to God. And so now we're adopted through Christ, and God's my father now. Not that I'm equal, I'm adopted. I'm his child. And so I have this personal relationship with God as my father. Then we're told, that, so we're elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, and it says, in sanctification of the Spirit. And this, in this sanctification is an ongoing process, and it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. To be sanctified, well, you, you might have heard the phrase like espiritu sancto or whatever it is. I can't pronounce things right. But, but it's this, this, um, this word sanct means holy. So if I'm getting sanctification, I'm being made more holy. Holification in my life. <laughs> this is what's happening in my life. And this, can I say, is one of the primary works of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer. When I cry out, pour out your spirit, Lord, give me more of your spirit. It's not just to give me the feels, although I love it when God gives me the feels. But I am actually getting the spirit so I can get the obedience thing going on. That's the filling of the spirit. In fact, the fruit of the spirit are things that represent obedience. Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, faithfulness, goodness, kindness, self-control. Yet there are many out there who think that being filled with the spirit is having a lack of self-control. And not controlling your own body is now evidence that you're filled with the spirit. But wait a minute, then how is that a fruit of the spirit? The fruit of the spirit is self-control. I'm walking in the spirit means I'm walking in obedience to God. So the Holy Spirit, it seems, it seems to me from Scripture, has two main immediate functions in the life of the believer. One is relational, by the Spirit we cry out, Abba, Father, and, and testifies of my relationship with God. So testifies internally, I know the Lord. And the other is for obedience, to walk in obedience to Jesus Christ. So when I, I don't know about you, but when I cry out, pour out your Spirit, Lord, I'm always thinking, so I can walk in greater holiness and obedience to you. That's what I want it for. That's what I want, the filling of the Holy Spirit. He empowers me to be bold and obedient and humble and all, all these wonderful qualities and attributes. <clears throat> Keep this in mind when you pray for the Holy Spirit. He guides us in the right way of thinking, in the right way of living, and it sanctifies our lives. We have our lives transformed when our minds are renewed by the Spirit. You know, th these wonderful things. Then the third thing, and the, and the third uh, member of the Trinity here, the, the, the um, uh, well, actually out of order here from the typical order, is the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Washed by the blood of Christ. Now, Jesus didn't actually literally sprinkle us with anything here. This is not talking about baptism. Baptism was an immersion thing, not even a sprinkling. What is this reference to? Well, Peter's referring to the Old Testament. And when the sacrifices took place in the Old Testament, they would take maybe like the hyssop or something like that. <coughs> they dip it in the blood of the sacrifice. And then, in fact, Moses did this in the initial inauguration of the covenant, sprinkles it on all the people. 
and they literally got sprinkled with blood. Which you might be like, whoa. Why? This is now, normally in the passages of Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, where you're like, what, what, what? You know, it causes you to like the triple take. This is because God wants your attention on this passage. Frequently, it's referring to Jesus, really. So we're sprinkled, and this refers to all the sacrifices. I mean, they would come in and they would go to the altar once a year. The one time they'd go into the Holy of Holies, the high priest would sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice on the altar. We are sprinkled by the blood of Jesus Christ. We are covered by his blood, that one sacrifice for all time. And in all the sacrifices of the Old Testament, we see pictures and lessons about the sacrifice of Jesus to get a fuller understanding of it and to be more prepared for it. If Jesus had come without the Old Testament prep preparing the way for him, so many less people would be saved because they wouldn't have this outside verification of who Christ is through the evidence of the Old Testament. There were, in those sprinklings, there were daily sacrifices that seemed to just be like, because you mess up every day. <laughs> there were um, once in a while sacrifices that were brought because someone had a specific sin issue and they would come and they'd bring a sacrifice. They were like, I really blew it. I'm going to go bring a sacrifice. And they'd confess it and they'd bring a sacrifice. And then there was like a yearly sacrifice of this kind and a yearly sacrifice of that kind. And so you've got all these different kinds of sacrifices going on. And can I say Jesus took care of all that? That his once-for-all sacrifice took care of my sin nature that I battle with daily, the great failings that I might have in my life, and then those just occasional random times in my life when I'm just like, eh, what's wrong with me? You know, And it's just the blood of Jesus covers us, period. And it is, it's all or nothing here. I mean, he, he covers us. We're covered. And so because of that, Peter can write, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. This is um, Peter's normal greeting is about grace and peace and the multiplication of it. I think it's interesting that it's multiplied, multiplied, like an increase. Um, and you might be like, well, how can grace increase in my life? Well, I mean, I'm covered by the blood of Christ. I'm already forgiven. But the word grace is in a very broad sense referred to any sort of favor that God is giving in your life. And so an increase of the gifts of the Spirit in your life. That would be considered the grace of God. Paul called his calling to ministry God's grace unto him. So God calling you to serve in some way or another, God's grace in your life. Um, peace being multiplied, that's something I can definitely get into. Because <laughs> I know, for me, and probably for you, I need more peace. Now, I have more than I had 10 years ago. Oh, are you kidding? Much more. Much, much more, actually but I could definitely use more. God's peace in my life to be multiplied. I think Philippians 4 is great homework if you choose to do so. I think Philippians 4 is like one of the mental health passages of the scriptures. And I mean, I'm convinced of this every time I look at it, every time I listen to it or read it, it is just so healthy for our hearts and minds. In fact, what does it say? That you, you, you do this and the peace of God, or the, the God of peace, <laughs> peace of God, it's in there both times in Philippians 4. The peace of God. And then later, um, if you think on these things, the God of peace will be with you, right? So there's the things you think about. Things that are lovely and noble and good and just and true and all that. And then the God of peace will be with you. Then you also have uh, taking every anxious thought and bringing it in prayer to God with thankfulness. That's super key. With thankfulness. And the peace of God will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. God's peace puts a guard around my heart and around my mind because we get attacked in both places. We get attacked in both places. Not only emotionally where I'm just like, Ugh, you know, emotions. Sometimes they're great. Sometimes they're horrible. They're like puppies, you know. <laughs> it's the cutest thing in the world until you leave them alone and then all of a sudden it's like, what happened? <clears throat> That's how emotions seem to be. And then in your mind, you need God's peace because your mind gets attacked with weird thoughts and weird ideas that sometimes are from you and sometimes I think are not from you. And you get these thoughts that burrow in and become like that root that sort of spreads that weed that kind of tries to spread out and take over um, thoughts of your own insecurities. And it usually ends up being just a general self-focus, which is why I then turn to God with thankfulness and prayer and pouring out my heart to him so, so I could have his peace to guard me. The implication here is this. It's normal for Christians to need God's peace to guard our hearts and minds. I find that encouraging. <laughs> it's not like you're failing as a Christian because you have these things. I mean, 
I'll just be honest. Like, I think that as Christians, and I'm sure non-Christians feel this way too, but there are times when like, say, middle of the night you wake up and you're just confused and you don't know what's going on and you're not really sure where you are. You have some weird idea stuck in your brain, just bugging you, bugging you, bugging you. I don't know if you've ever had that. I know I have. All I know is we are but dust. We are but dust. And we need God's peace and God's help and God's hope. And I take all the, any moment like that as like, Lord, this is just training for the next trauma that's coming down the road. I just want to have trust and faith in you and confidence in you in the middle of this so that I can have your peace and grace multiplied in my life. We definitely need that. And it is definitely available. And then in verse 3, <clears throat> he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this is totally unnecessary. Verse 3, he could easily just say, God, according to his abundant mercy, has begotten us again to a living hope. But he starts off with, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because Paul, just like Peter, just busts into worship because he's just excited about the Lord. <laughs> he says, oh, blessed be the Lord. He's just praising God. It is, I think, in the heart of believers to worship God. And there's something about it where it's just like um, eating food, I, and guys may get this more than the girls do, how when you're really hungry, but you don't know it, until you get that first bite, and all of a sudden your body's like, oh, oh yes, I need a lot more of this. And then all of a sudden you just start wolfing it down. And sometimes we can kind of go through life and we haven't been worshiping the Lord, haven't been seeking God, haven't been on our knees, haven't just spent time with the Lord in praise. But the moment you begin to just talk of the things of God, it just wells up in you. And you're like, oh, God's so good. God is wonderful. Oh, the Lord is good. Blessed be the Lord. Blessed be the name of God. Because it just wells up within you. And there's just this, um, this natural response. I mean, you have a spirit, and your spirit longs to draw near to God. And God must be worshipped in spirit and truth. And so it seems to be natural to me. So I encourage you, you know, to make time for it. And let it become a spontaneous thing. Spontaneous worship is a beautiful thing. <clears throat> or you just stop and praise God for whatever it is that he's doing at the time. Bible study should never just be scholastic. I mean, I, I want to uh, love the Lord with my whole mind, but also my heart, my strength, my soul, all of me, you know, all of it. I, I want to love the Lord with all of that. This doesn't mean I have to stir up fake emotions. It's just I take whatever I've got and I, I give that to God. I don't worry about the degree Am I agape or am I just phileo? It was like, well, whichever one you got, how about you give that to the Lord? How about you just bring him glory, bring him honor, bring him praise? And um, instead of evaluating the degree and the level and the, and, the, and the goodness of your worship, how about you evaluate the goodness of the one you worship and make it about him and not you? <laughs> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And next week we'll continue talking about our living hope the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, one of my favorite topics of all time. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we thank you for your holy word that, um, that just makes us right. It guards us and protects us against um, uh, false teaching, false leaders, false thinking. And Lord, we just pray for you to guard our hearts and minds. Grant us the peace of God that passes understanding so that we can be believers who are secure, not in ourselves, but secure in you, who are comforted by you, and who are in a place of spontaneous love and affection for our great God and Savior, who has uh, given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We love you. We bless you, God. We worship you, our King, our glorious, wonderful Father. In Jesus' name, amen. We will pray.